we scoot back. Um, <coughs> okay. So I'm going to skip to chapter 10 because the rest is just explaining how everything works and why everything works. And if you're watching this video, you already know how the basics work. And if you don't, look it up in another video because every other video on YouTube explains how the basics work. So, chapter 10 is all about creating products and packages that please consumers' brains. Very useful. <coughs> so we're going to go straight to chapter 10. Chapter 9 talks about brands on the brain. Could be useful, but I could just tell you how the brands affect the brain. Determining how it affects you emotionally, affects a person emotionally, that's how people want to not think. They want to think emotionally. They don't want to have to make a decision. And yes, that is something I read from chapter 9. So chapter 10, let's get to it. 157. 157. Okay. <coughs> Let me turn this off. Drink some water. In this chapter, we look at how the brain science of neuromarketing can help companies create products that people want to buy <coughs> and packages that stand out on the shelf alongside dozens of not hundreds of alternatives you know off brands and you've seen this before probably in other videos where they put and if you haven't where they put the shitty product here the product you're gonna buy in the middle and the product that's too expensive right here so you look at the one that's too expensive, you say, I'm not going to buy that. You look at the one that is too cheap, and you say, that's low quality, I don't want that. So you look at the middle one, and you say, hey, that's a known brand, I like that. That's reasonably priced, I'm going to buy it. <coughs> that's what they mean by the first line. How new products get noticed. When a shopper approaches a typical shelf in a typical aisle in a typical grocery store, a lot of typicals, or other retail grocery outlet, he can easily find himself gazing at hundreds and millions, no they don't say millions, I said millions, <coughs> of different products and packages. Not only are different brands and products competing yeah, for our attention on the shelf, but a single product may have, may have many variations a popular laundry detergent, for example, might have 50 different packaging and ingredient variant, variants displayed on the shelf together. In Chapter 9, we explain and establish brand leaders and new brand <coughs> upstarts have very different challenges when it comes to attracting consumers. That's true. Established brands have the advantages of similarity product experience and habitual buying which means habit buying <coughs> okay where was I habitual buying to maintain and grow their existing market share while new brands must leverage novelty and persuasion and begin building their own market presence let me explain that in an easier way present companies that already exist like Nike Disney um, uh, Kellogg's companies you know about and known for years market like crazy and market on TV they market on the internet they market everywhere and they do very good so that you know about them and you remember them <coughs> but new companies don't have any of those things and we're not used to them so they have to work harder to get their brand out there like Facebook for example you see a natural thing on Facebook, but they only promote it one time on Facebook. It gets shared by millions of people, but <coughs> it's not shown on TV. It's not shown anywhere else. So people kind of just forget about it. You have to continuously emotionally affect the people with your brand name. Like how I slowly, sorry about that, <coughs> like I slowly and slowly bring up my book. Um, in, almost, in some of my videos, I'm starting to bring up my book more so people know about it. 
I haven't marketed it yet, which I will, but at least I'm bringing it up. And you should keep bringing it up continuously so people know about it. Let's go on. <coughs> if I talk too much, my asthma kicks in. <coughs> Standing out versus blending in. The tension between novelty and similarity is an old marketing battleground. Marketer, marketers know intuitively that too much similarity leads to boredom. That's true. Eventual consumer deflection. While too much novelty causes new production to be rejected because consumers can't see how it fits into product category, they know well this balance between novelty and similarity relates to approach and avoidance motivations. This illustrates figure 10 to 1, which is right here. You can't see this, but it says overwhelming to interesting to comforting to boring, which doesn't really... Yeah, it would. It should be interesting to comforting to overwhelming to boring. That would make more sense. <coughs> but what they're saying, what what they're trying to say is that if something is too overwhelming and in your face, it becomes boring. You have to give it in smaller increments, and anything just like anything in excess is bad. Just like drugs, just like food, anything in excess is bad. You have to do it in little amounts over time. <clears throat> That's pretty much all it's saying. Let's think about that for a second. You don't want it to be too familiar. You don't want it to be too unique. So you want a middle ground of being familiar and unique. Oh, if it... <clears throat> there we go. If it becomes too novel, too interesting... It can disrupt habit buyers. As described in Chapter 9, the trigger variety seeking, the trigger people, a response that leading product generally want to avoid, but if it doesn't refresh itself from time to time, it risks becoming boring. <coughs> so let me which also opens it up to challenges from alternatives. Because products typically are part of a familiar category, we have to consider the product's novelty or similarity in relation to the category. A new product enhances its ability to stand out among more familiar competitors in its category. If it can do two things, be physically distinct enough to draw involuntary attention to the point of sale and signal either implicitly or explicitly the goals it helps the consumer achieve. <coughs> Let's consider an example of how these factors may work together to help a new product stand out on the shelf. Imagine, imagine a consumer approaching her grocery store yogurt aisle where a new yogurt product is present on the shelf. Yogurt is not a habit purchase for her. She does, that means she doesn't buy yogurt usually. But she's in the yogurt aisle. Nor does she have a product or brand preference in her mind. So she's in the yogurt aisle but she doesn't know what she wants to get. Her initial scan of the shelf typically gives each package only a few milliseconds of gaze time. In that brief, brief moment, <coughs> the new yogurt needs to make its case. It either attracts her attention or gets passed over, unnoticed. Three package attributes are most important at this moment. Color, shape, in brightness. <coughs> so remember, color, shape, and brightness. Although some colors, red, orange, and shapes, round, round edges, curvy, have natural attention attracting capabilities, remember that, rewind the video if you didn't hear that, 
The key element for on-shelf standout is distinctiveness. That's what they're saying. A bright orange box would stand out in isolation, but not on a shelf of all orange boxes. Neuromarketing tests that measure attention to a product package in isolation tells you nothing about how much attention that product will attach on a crowded shelf. Standing out is important. Then get naked. No, just kidding. But it's only a first step on the path to purchase. A new yogurt can't afford to be different simply for the sake of being different. If that makes sense to you. It also must communicate meaningful signals that the consumer can interpret as addressing one of her goals. Why is it a her? It can be a he. <laughs> the last page was a he. A new yogurt must easily convey attributes like freshness, taste, and healthy eating. This process can have both conscious and non-conscious effects, the subconscious mind. At non-conscious level, products, brands, and other cues in shopping environment, like signs and displays, yeah, can trigger non-conscious goal purchases. This may result in a consumer paying more attention to one product on a shelf than others. This type of attention is called bottom-up attention because it occurs involuntary as a result of process of motivational priming. Motivational priming is what Nike does. <coughs> priming is where you teach someone a certain thing and attach it to a certain thing. When you attach a name to a dog and you give it a treat, it's the same thing as attaching a brand to a person's brain when giving them Gatorade. You show Gatorade while you show the Nike symbol and a guy jogging. You're priming someone <coughs> that sports <coughs> works with Gatorade, when really Gatorade is just sugar. <laughs>